For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. How would you uh, differentiate between a careful scientist and a not careful scientist? Well, ultimately, a scientist is not someone who should be absolutely claiming authority and absolute claiming the truth of things. That is inconsistent with science. Science, um, you know, exactly what their attitude should be is under discussion. I, I actually had uh, discussions about this with the late Carl Sagan, because I also work in the planetary science area. And Carl was a, an advocate of what's called skepticism, that one should always be exceedingly skeptical of things. Now, I Even don't your own ideas, right? Yeah, it, it, well, including your own ideas. <laughs> and that's the key part. Uh, my view is that the important, an important element of science is called fallibilism. Fallibilism, which people don't... Um, maybe haven't really heard about it's a philosophical idea and i'm as you may know i'm into philosophy of science uh it it is the recognition that it's exceedingly exceedingly difficult to know in absolute terms that you are completely correct that you always have to be willing to admit there may be a possibility that you are wrong and that's absolutely essential to science because science is not about claiming that you have absolute truths. Science is about the process, the absolute dedication to searching, investigating, seeking the truth, and to do that with the sense of humility before the entity that has that truth and the entity that has that truth is nature reality whatever you are studying the reality of that is where the truth lies mm -hmm. and ultimately whether you are somebody who is a, a theorist and trying to say the best things you can say about nature things that sound good to others you have to go to nature to see if that's correct. Mm -hmm. But the other kind of science, and it's the science that I ultimately came to uh, invest my career in, is the one that starts with nature itself. It tries to interpret what nature is presenting to us. It's more like an investigator. An investigator doesn't go to a crime scene and say, I've got a theory about how this works and I'm gonna see if my theory is right. That gets investigators into a lot of trouble. <laughs> investigators go there looking for clues, yeah. looking for evidence. Looking but if you know for... who did it, you could just plant evidence, you know, and then it'll make your- <laughs> Of course, you have to be careful of that. But nature, and Einstein said this, Nature is subtle, but not malicious. Nature may make it difficult, but it, the truth is always there. Nature doesn't have a uh, agenda to be evil, or uh, it, it is magnificent, wonderful, beautiful. Human beings have a sense of that, and that sense, unfortunately, is manipulated by those who don't have the kind of attitude that I've talked about. Yeah. Now, you know, talking about people's attitudes is a bit psychological. Uh, we, we have to uh, understand their motivations and it's, and it's uh, tricky to do that with regard to individuals. But when one is in the community of people of scientists, what, one has a sense of is that the people in that community, the ones that you can trust, the ones that you uh, have experience with, are the ones that have this sense that it's the world that's ultimately going to give us the answer. And that 
we have a kind of humility relative to that, not an arrogance that we can actually find the truth, but a kind of optimism that it's there and that ultimately we will make progress in the process of looking for it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the science community is important. It's, it's not like it's a uh, evil cohort that's preventing new ideas from coming into uh, existence. Uh, this is an, uh, something manipulated by those who feel that they have this grand theory that uh, the rest of the science community isn't paying attention to. It is much more subtle than that. Uh, and that's a reason why uh, the, what's called the scientific consensus is important. Not because the scientists have the absolute answer, but we can trust that the people who have this ethic of looking for the truth of things, that if they are members of the community that does that, that's the best thing we can trust. Because people can always go to sources that claim absolute truth. Uh, we, we are in a crazy political world now where such things are being talked about. Mm -hmm. That's not science. It is, it is completely uh, different. Than but it feels what... good, you know? It feels good. <laughs> yes. It, it, it feel, wild ideas feel good. Extravagant ideas. Mm -hmm. That when are, someone says they've got all the answers, you know, they've got this model, you know, and oh, you know, this is and it, it makes it, uh, history or prehistory more exciting. It's uh, you can understand why people might like it. Yeah. But I know it, what you're it, uh, it, there's definitely an appeal and there is also an appeal. And some scientists like the late Carl Sagan uh, tried to. Uh, convey the uh, the wonder of uh, of the natural world, the the absolute wonder in what nature has to present, which is in many ways much more magnificent than what people can invent. But we're in a terrible state now where people have a misunderstanding of science. It, it's, it, they have a misunderstanding that science is this monolithic thing of absolutes, unfortunately manipulated by those that want to claim authority. They claim science as an authority. Um, Einstein once said, uh, all my life I have questioned authority, but in my old age, uh, in punishment for this, I have become an authority. <laughs> it, it, you know, the authority in science is not the people who are saying it. The authority is nature. The author nature as the absolute is the absolute. So the truth of one's dedication to searching that uh, that in an honest way is the truth that science has to convey. Uh, the answers are provisional, but they are trustworthy. And I would say they're more trustworthy than the uh, people who claim authority and claim to speak in absolute terms, even if those are great sounding stories. Human beings uh, love stories. They, you know, there's, there's something you know, in the evolutionary genetics of people that has led to uh, their relationship to stories as ways they cope with the world. Yeah. That's definitely there. Speaking but of that, what, that, that fallibility. What thing. better story is there than what has really happened and what oh, yeah. is really the case? And that is magnificent. Wait, it's a true story, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, some people have come to me and, and uh, talked about how the fallibility of science is a mark against it. <laughs> you know, like, well, science has been wrong before. Look at they changed their mind about this. You can't trust them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, but actually, the do you want to do you want to trust anybody that claims an absolute authority? Where, where does that come from? Do they have some special insight into nature? Have they done the hard work of 
trying to get nature to re reveal herself. Uh, they make a good story. They make money off of it. They, they get a claim. Uh, all of these are, they can use logic in their story. They can cite facts in their story. They can cite lots of scientific work. Facts, uh, citing knowledge, that is not science. Unfortunately, in our education system, uh, people are, are being told that science is uh, a collection of facts. It's a collection of truths about the world, or it's a methodology, a, a kind of you pose hypothesis, you do experiment, and you discover the truth because you match your model to the world. The world is consistent with your model, and that's correct. I won't get into it, but there's logical problems in spades with all of that. Ah. That is not science by itself. More important than that is this, what I've called fallibilism, which is this honest openness, but incredible hard work, like a incredible detective in figuring out what's going on. Because nature is subtle. Nature uh, isn't uh, sort of advertising her facts. The, the, the proper scientist has to work exceedingly hard with many techniques and much modern technology to extract what is really going on and what has really happened. Nature is not this, on social media, right? <laughs> oh, no. So, social media is propelling uh, stories uh, and people are looking for the best sounding story. Yeah. Well... Sounding good is not the same as being good. Being good is what nature presents. Mm -hmm. And that is what science is really about. Well, what, do you uh, say, what do you say to people who uh, say, well, we're just saying keep an open mind. You know, maybe uh, our idea could be right. And, you know, the Graham Hancocks of the world, the Randall Carlson's, say, we're just saying keep an open mind. We're just questioning authority. That's all. Uh we're not saying they, we have absolute truth. Uh, of course. But if you are going to be a scientist, you want to have a protective, a, a, uh, a not protective, a uh, productive inquiry into the possibility of finding the truth. Yes, you are open to facts, but you are also not looking at every possibility just because it sounds good. You are looking into things that are leading you on a productive pathway toward truth. If the, and this is very important. Science is a process that is trying to productively seek truth. We sometimes talk about our ideas being fruitful. There's an even more uh, obscure word for what we are trying to do. The idea is having a kind of ubrisness to it. This is an old English word. And it is not just that the idea is simply productive, but it's part of a whole uh, line of inquiry that is uh, telling us as we go along that we are on the right path. And that's an attitude that you take. Not that the story sounds good, but that in the process of doing it, you discover things that are leading you more productively along that path. So you have to be open to those discoveries, but you also have to be able to evaluate them relative to whatever is being discovered and has gone before so that you have a whole body of things that are consistent and leading productively on this path. If you ever think, oh, I have the answer now. It's so wonderful. All these aliens came and did it. And, uh, and I have all of these things, uh, you know, uh, I've been uh, kind of interacting with people telling those stories for a long time. Uh, one of the early ones I encountered in my career was uh, Eric Van Danigan, oh, yeah. who 
published quite a few books on uh, sort of ancient aliens and how they were uh, coming to the earth and in the time of the dinosaurs and, you know, mixing up all kinds of things that geologically we knew were completely uh, inappropriate. But one thing I'll say for Danigan is he was very honest. He uh, pointed out that he was, yes, he was writing about these things, but he was, he was an entertainer, that he was doing this to make a good story. Uh, I remember uh, one of my uh, paleontology colleagues at University of Texas, where I was uh, many years ago before I was at uh, uh, Arizona, he took me out in the field to look at some of the uh, dinosaur tracks in the Glen Rose Formation, Cretaceous in central Texas, where Von Gennigan had a picture in his book of um, human footprints. He claimed human footprints that were uh, along a pathway adjacent to these three-toed uh, dinosaur uh, footprints. They, it was probably a duck-billed dinosaur. They, they swam in shallow water, and there's other indications in the deposits that this was shallow water. So comparing what Danigan's photograph showed and the footprints, it was very clear what was going on because the actual marks on the, uh, on the rocks that had been preserved were singular uh, linear traces. They weren't three toed, they weren't five toed footprints. What D Danigan had done was he had wet the mark so they would be more visible, but he added five little dots at the end of them. I understand. Yes. Uh, and uh, he would say, well, you know, this is uh, to make the story good. But but it's very likely that what was going on is that these three toed dinosaurs were swimming and uh, they have a longer toe in the middle. And uh, as they pushed themselves along, one of these these would uh, scrape the water bottom and these would go along a bit. Another scrape just about in the same uh, sort of uh, distance as human footprints would be and the track had the same distance as human footprints, but it was, it was formed in a, in a completely different way. Now, this is an investigation that you do to figure out what was really going on. And, and you use all the tools you can to figure that out. It's not about finding things that are consistent with a story that you are trying to tell. That, that's called uh, sham reasoning, where you know the answer and you are piling up a lot of, you know, good sounding evidences, logical argument, et cetera, that is uh, going to look like it's consistent with your story. That kind of reasoning is uh, easier to find, as I said, from Von Danigan. There's another kind of defect in reasoning that is a little more difficult to deal with called fake reasoning. It, this word has been thrown out and used uh, improperly. But fake reasoning is we, when your motivation, and now we're talking a psychological motivation, is not to find the truth of what nature presents. Your motivation is to make money, to be on uh, podcasts, or you know, to get uh, attention. Uh, it's not a scientific motivation. So it's you know, not up to me uh, to know the motivations of the people who are uh, doing this kind of stuff. Uh, but one has to be somewhat suspicious <laughs> that maybe uh, this is a, uh, a motivation problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and like Von Danigan, you know, if it's entertaining and it's, uh, you know, people can enjoy the story just like a fiction book there's nothing inherently wrong with that it but it should not be claiming to be science